Good afternoon. Today we are in the, does anybody remember what the, the section is? The Passover. Uh, it's, it's really funny. I don't know if you guys have noticed this, but when we do the E100, or especially when we prep for it, I feel like almost every week I get to it, I'm like, this is the most important passage in the Bible. <laughs> You know, and it is, it's a frequent thing. It's like, uh, you know, gen you know gen creation, right? Like, this is it. And then you get to the covenant with Abram, and you're like, this, right? Like, this is what everything is based on. And it just keeps being that way, right? Like, the Passover, this is it, though, right? I mean, we, this is the, the linchpin, the most important thing of the Bible. And it, it, and it see, you know, an argument can be made that this, this is it. Um, you'll notice... Well, I don't want to. I don't want to do a little spoiler for you, but but you'll see you'll see how important this is in the text itself. Uh, again, I would encourage you, as uh, Father Chris has done, to be uh, reading. You know, as you go through, to make sure you kind of keep step with it. If we were to hit every single passage of the Bible and not be selective, uh, we would be doing this for probably the next thirty or forty years. Which, you know, um, but that might be a slow pace, especially when you get into numbers. Um, there's some, there's some genealogies in there. So, uh, that being said, we're just going to read, I believe, let's go ahead and start reading, and by we I mean royal we. Uh, we're going to read from verses 1 through 13 to kind of kick us off. And we're going to go from there. Uh, so again, this is Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 through 13. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt... This month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons. According to what each can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Verse 7, Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the house in which they eat. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire, with unleavened bread, and bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roast it, its head with its legs and its inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt." So, you'll remember last week, um, and if you were at home uh, watching the Kavanaugh ordeal, you were excused. Um, I won't mark you as absent, but I do hope that you caught up, uh, because last week we were talking about the first nine plagues, right? It was, uh, you know, and, and it kind of went with, uh, you know, Moses would do a warning, Pharaoh would listen to the warning, then either he would harden his own heart or it would say that God hardened his heart, right? And then it would come to pass, and it was kind of this ongoing thing that caused really a phenomenal amount of damage, right? I mean, if you think about that, the locust swarms, uh, you know, the Nile, like their source of water, the disease that struck, this was, this was you know, not some isolated incident that only affected a few Egyptians. It was, it was a huge amount of devastation. And then finally, we get to the Passover, the final plague. Did anybody ever see, I remember I mentioned a couple weeks ago that movie, Exodus, Gods, and Kings. Did anybody ever see that one with Christian Bale? And um, you, you saw it? Okay. Um, obviously not overly accurate, but not, in, not intended to be, right? I mean, as we say, the book is always better than the movie. So, but, but at the same time, they really, they really captured this and kind of took God to task over this final 
this final, um, uh, the final plague, you could say, the, the final of the judgments. And so um, we're going to talk a little bit about that today, and then we're also going to just do a little bit of background about what this means for us going forward. You know, what, what is this Passover for us, and is it still significant? Um, so, first of all, we see, again, this might be one of, this is one of the most important, if not the most important, passages that defined the identity of the Israelites. And you see that because look at one of the first things that happens in verse 2. What does God say? How will this, how will this fundamentally shift their culture? There's a very practical way that it does so in verse 2. Does anybody talk? It changes the whole calendar, right? This is the beginning. This is the be, this is the beginning of your nation, right? It's kind of a re, it's maybe a restart. We could think of it as a baptism, which is really the river, the Red Sea, which we'll get to. But anyway, it's kind of like you know that restart, that new life of your nation. This is this is a fundamental, important event to you, um, and it's designed from henceforth to remind them of becoming a people. Right, like becoming a people. One of the patterns I said, one of the things to look for in Exodus is God taking the slave nation and transforming them, and I don't mean transforming like wave of magic wand, but 40 years of suffering and difficulty into his chosen people, right? I mean, that's, that's the Christian experience too, right? It's God, you know, you have recognized Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you seek to follow him, and then your life is, is really... I would not say easier, right? Because you're going, like God is forming and shaping you and you're engaging with God and you're being transformed and made into his people. Which is why, um, this is a brief tangent, um, but this is why antinomianism in Christianity is so dangerous. Antinomianism is um, basically grace, grace, only grace, doesn't matter how you live. You all familiar with that idea? It's basically the idea of once you're, all, it, the law is, doesn't matter at all. It's not that it's even helpful. It's just all the law is there is to remind you of your own sin. And everything else is just receive grace from God, be thankful to God, and live how you want to. This is, by the way, what I was, like, what I, I'm not going to say I was taught this growing up, but this is what I heard growing up, and a lot of people my age did. Does that make sense to you all? Well, I'm not being, if I live that way, I'm not being, one, I'm not free because I'm a slave to my sin, but two, I'm not being shaped and transformed into a person of God, right? Like we who are Christians look forward to sanctification, which is always a hard process, right? I mean, that, that's kind of our call. Does that make sense? Being refined and shaped and transformed. And so you'll see in Exodus, this is a pattern that goes all the way back to the Israelites with God's people is this kind of crucible that they go through that grows them and shapes them and transforms them, right? So again, this, that whole aside, aside um, that's, kind of, that's kind of a pattern that we're looking at in Exodus, and, and this is the remembrance of the beginning of that. Um, and at its heart, the Passover, it's a commemorative meal. It's a, it's a festival. It's a feast. Can you all think of any holidays or celebrations we have that are feasts? What do you think? Christmas is a feast, right? Christmas is traditionally a feast, right? You get everybody together, you have your Christmas dinner. Thanksgiving, that's coming up around the corner. That's a, that's a feast, right? I mean, so we still have these commemorative feasts. Um, and I would actually argue that in a lot of your families, the, the preparation is also very, like, down to a science, right? Like, you know who's bringing what, you know. In our house, we have Ada's Potatoes, which is my grandmother's name, right? Like, you know, these people, there's a, there's a real um, rhythm and ritual that goes along with, with preparations for feasts. That's a really normal thing. Now, I don't think God necessarily ordained your personal, you know, cranberry sauce or whatever, but, but you get the idea. Um, not that he didn't. I'm not, gonna, I'm not stepping into that one. Um, too late. So, one, one thing that's interesting here, if you look at it, it, it talks about getting a lamb. That's, or a goat that's a year old. Uh, a couple things I want to say about this. I've heard some really emotive sermons about the Passover, about how, you know, this, this lamb was the family pet, you know, and they raised it, and they cherished it, and they loved it, and it was, you know, to create that bond. And this was, a few pastors have done this, trying to say, well, it's, you know, in that way, it's, you know, trying to bring that closeness to remind us of the sacrifice of Jesus and the hurt that it caused. Um, it's a great story. Uh, it's not true, but, but it is a good story. What, what's true is, at, at a one years old, they were almost fully grown, right? So this isn't, this isn't you know, a little baby running around. They're almost fully grown at this point. Um, number two, it, this passage is not, the word is lamb here, but that's a little more broad word for, uh, for livestock than just lamb. 
Um, and number three, you know, they had it in the house for four days, which it's not that you, you don't bond in four days, but that's not quite the same thing. Does that make sense? So just in case, I've heard that a lot, actually. Um, and again, it's great preaching fodder. Um, I wouldn't do it because you're kind of making stuff up. But anyway, that's, um, so it wasn't necessarily to form a bond with the animal to have it in the house, although who knows how that goes. Um, but it is important. There's a couple important things about it. One, it's perfect, right, without blemish. Right? You, you offer your best to God. I mean, and that's something we all agree with, right? I mean, we, we all understand. Uh, first fruits is what we would call it. The way, since we don't, you know how the Pharisees, they used to sacrifice not just money, or like offer not just money, but every little bit of thing that they had. Like if they got spice, they would give 10% of spice and 10%. Don't do that, by the way, because we don't like, you can keep your spice. We're, we're very grateful for, for your time and your monetary offerings, but spice we're okay with. Um, but there was this idea of, you know, again, first fruits, right? God deserves the best. Um, that's why when, uh, for example, my household ties, we tithe off the gross, right? And not the net, because it's our concept of that is first fruits. Like, that's, that's how we look at it. Um, and so, and one other distinctive part about this is that the entire animal was to be eaten, right? The entire animal was to be eaten. You weren't to leave anything behind, um, I'm not a huge fan of that, right? Like, I like my particular cut of meat, and that's it. Thank you very much. But the idea was to consume the entire animal. Um, and I was thinking about that, and I was also thinking about the communal nature of it. And what I love, you know, I'm a relatively new Episcopalian, right? I'd say, I think, nine years at this point. Um, you know, I mean, matrilineally forever, but, but personally for about nine years. Well, it's really fun to see how our our representation of the faith, you know, is, is found in Scripture. One of the things I found here is, one, being a communal meal across the entire community, they all were doing the same thing at the same time. As many gathered together in a house as possible, right? But still, even if they're separate, they're doing the same thing at the same time. Sounds familiar, right? That's, a, that's an ancient, ancient practice. Uh, you know, we have, again, the Book of Common Prayer is no longer, you know, they've, since decided to make it kind of uh, specific to region, but there was a point where, what, millions upon, you know, tens of millions of people were doing the same prayers at the same time and still are in, in a large sense. Well, you see that here, right? It's a, it's a, we, we're so Western and individualistic that we don't think about the communal nature of these things happening, right? But they thought in terms of community first. Their culture was a lot more akin to even East, East Asian cultures as they're, as they're expressed today, than our culture is, right? Do you all follow me so far? I mean, Middle Eastern, right? It, East, like the Eastern portion of that would describe, I mean, it's honor-shame culture, right? It's typically community culture. Does that does all kind of make sense? So um, this is a real tying the whole nation together. And it's also why, and no, no Father Rodriguez did not pay me to do this, um, but it's also why when we take the chalice, you know, like we we prefer people to uh, drink straight from the chalice than in tinct. The reason be, and then the reason we use as few chalices as possible is because for all of Christian tradition, you know, like you, you had a common, that was called the common cup, right? It was a shared chalice that represented your unity with everyone else. It wasn't about you getting your, your blood for the day. Does that make sense? Like it wasn't, you know, it wasn't give me my blood and, you know, my neighbor does too. It was the, it was the sharing of the communal cup. And in this way, the sharing of the lamb, you know, among, or the sharing of uh, the livestock among all the people that were there, it was supposed to be a communal meal. And that was actually a really big part of it. Do you see what I'm saying? And so, and I do think it would be helpful for us to think, because Passover is basically about salvation, right? We're going to get to that. But it's really helpful for us to think of salvation not only in individualistic terms, but communal terms. Right? Like, it does. Because as the people around, for many reasons, but one of them is as the people around you are saved and sanctified, well, that rubs against you and it should rub you the right way. Does that make sense? Like, like your, um, anybody have a spouse who was ever holier than them for a time? I have. You know, like, we, we look at them and you're like, wow, you, you're walking the walk a little better than I am right now. Right? And it's, and if you've got the right mindset about what Christ has done for you, it doesn't shame you. It, it causes you to say, well, that's pretty great. I'd like that too. Does that make sense? So there's a communal aspect of salvation. I know I'm going on some tributaries here, but stick with me. There's a communal aspect of 
salvation that's present in this, in this nationwide shared meal. Um, and it's, I mean, the meal is holy, right? Like it was ordained by God, commanded by God to be done in a certain way. There's a holiness to this meal. Yes? I knew someone was going to ask me that. Um, I can't remember. Sarah knows. Sarah knows. I have heard that. I have heard that it's to remind them of the bitterness, like that it's um, yeah, the bitterness of leaving, because it is difficult. I've also heard that they travel well. Um, so, you know, which would be like the, the less meaningful but more practical sort of way. So um, I'm going to go with what, I'm going to go with the, the bitterness of leaving, because again, it preaches better. But, um, no, but, I, but I, you know, and, I, and that's probably true. Um, it's, it's certainly more true than what I said earlier. And, and it is a lot of commentators have said that. Let me put it that way. So, but, because again, if you think about it, we're talk, we, well, we might as well talk about it now. That's hard. Like, think about this. Israel had been in slavery for as long as America has been a nation at this point. That's a long time. Right? Like, that's a, that's a long, you know, that's a long time. Um, and... It's actually hard for us to understand because we're so mobile, right? I mean, you guys could hop on a plane and fly across the country tomorrow. But that just, you know, and you, you probably, tra- you know, many of you have probably traveled the world or at least the United States or at least the region in the United You know, you've seen things. Um, the amount of miles that you travel per day, even going around town, is unheard of in ancient times, right? Like if you're, you know, you go to the grocery store and you pick up your dry cleaning and, you know, that's, that's a two-day journey, right? So... Um, so it's hard for us to understand what that must be like because it's so easy for us. But, you know, for, for people who have never seen or gone or done anything else, um, you're, leaving, you're leaving everything. And your dad's everything, which being a communal, uh, a communal culture was even more important, right? Because the home of your ancestors, was that was it. Uh, kind of like South Carolinians, like Carolinians, right? I mean, you know, it's the home of your ancestors. It's that, you know, it's, it's significant. It's important. And I would argue for good reason. Um, so, anyway, uh, verse 3, tell the congregation the tenth day to the Lamb. Are you all starting to already connect some of this to some, some New Testament stuff going on here? Right? I mean, what are some obvious parallels that we can think of uh, to, the Christian, to the Christian story of, about what's happened? Sacrifice. Yeah, sacrificing of the Lamb, the Messiah, right? Which is... Which is what this is, what this, this is very obviously pointing towards. And um, the, the new covenant emphasis on the unity. Uh, what is it? Ephesians 4 something. Um, maintain the unity of the spirit through the bonds of peace. Right Again, I'm going to keep emphasizing unity because that can be very foreign to us. And, and like traveling, it's hard to understand. Um, all right, well, let's continue. Um, yes. Striking down every both humans and animals. Mm-hmm. The assumption is that that is males. But this says firstborn, everybody. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think the... So, she said, um, striking down firstborn, the assumption is that it's males, but here it doesn't specify that it was males. Right? It's human beings. Of human beings and livestock and everything else. Um, so, that has to do with the why, firstborns. And, and I think the why argument presents the case for why male is because, um, well, one, there is actually, and you can see this in Exodus 22, I think Numbers 3, where Moses, um, one of the laws of Moses is actually that uh, Israelites have to redeem their firstborns. They have to contribute shekels for their firstborns because they're four. What's that? Yes. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but I, I can't pronounce it, but yes. Um, the uh, buying your firstborn, you know, redeeming them because your firstborns were said to belong to God. Like, like they, God, God, the firstborns belong to God. That was the idea. And so you were to redeem the firstborn. It was, that was God's right. 
you know, God, God being the creator and sustainer and redeemer and all the million names of God of everything, like he has a right to more than we realize, right? Like God owns you, right? Whether, whether you choose to submit to that or not has a lot to do with how your life goes, right? I mean, it just does. You can rebel against it if you want to and create a lot of problems for yourself, but he owns, you know, God owns me. He owns my car. He owns my shoes. He owns my son. He owns my dog. He owns, right? I mean, that's, I'm being blunt, but that's what lordship means. It's sovereign lordship. Um, and it, it, it grates with us until we realize that, one, we're, we're born for it and made for it, and, um, which means that life goes a lot better for us when we live into the design that we were created for, right? And that it's also not a tyrannical ownership, right? It's, I mean, it's not tyranny. Uh, it's not a dictatorship. Uh, well, in, in the negative connotation. Yes, Paul? Now, something occurred to me, though. The Pharaoh, usually the king is the firstborn. Okay, yeah. The Pharaoh, in theory, should be the firstborn, unless you know his brother died before. Him. Yeah, so, the, died there is conversation about that. Um, and I'm trying to remember which Pharaoh, I don't remember offhand which Pharaoh this was. It was, are, you, are we sure it was, I know it was in the city of Ramses. It was a bad <laughs> So, I don't know. Uh, there's, there's, there, there, again, there, there are, I did not look at this recently. I, I seem to remember there being conversations of him historically being the younger brother or, um, or being exempt because he was the one to whom this was being proven. Uh, you know, so there's a lot of there's a lot of possibilities there. There's a lot of there's a lot of these wonderful gray areas. Um, oh, let me say one more thing. Last week we talked about God hardening Pharaoh's heart and Pharaoh hardening his own heart, right? And going between those. And there's been a lot of Christian discussion about you know why or when, who hardened what, when, and we still kind of do that today, right? Like, did I get blessed because God blessed me or because something just happened? Right? Am I suffering because God is punishing me or because suffering's just happening? You, all, you know the question I'm talking about, right? Um, what you'll find in the Old Testament is they don't try to draw a clear line of distinction between the two. Does that make sense? Like, like it's just kind of like, this is happening. It's probably God. Does that, does that make sense? Like, they don't try to really, we like to parse things out and narrow it down and figure it out and know exactly what's what, right? Like, that's the way we think. They didn't think that way. You remember how two weeks ago I said um, they had gods that had a lot of crossover, right? Like there were like at least three gods of the Nile and some, you know, and they, they, they didn't care very much about these distinctions. That wasn't important to them. I mean, they were also in survival mode, right? Like their lives were hard. So it's not like they sat around and were just kind of like, hmm, you know, like I wonder about this. That's not how they thought. But anyway, so when you think about Old Testament stuff where it's like God did this or this happened, Realize that they didn't typically think in, in the compartmentalized terms that we think in. Does that make sense? So people, what you'll find is people waste a lot of time and a lot of ink trying to, trying to figure things out when people just didn't think that way. And so I would encourage you not to get stuck, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Like if, they, if it was good enough for them to say, you know, let that, let that be a lesson for you too. Um, all right, so let's continue on. Um. Yes. I am amazed at the detail of, uh, of their demand on how they would eat. Oh, the detail of the demand? Sandals on your feet, standing with your shaft, yeah. all that kind of stuff. And um, it, it is that uh, just to make sure that they realize that God is in control So, a couple things about that. Well, one, a lot of things about that, actually. Um, one is just the very bare bones, right? They're getting ready for travel. It's happening tonight. It's imminent. It's going to be time to go, right? So, you, so you, uh, you, know, you, you belt up your cloak so, you, so it's easier for you to move. You tuck in your beard, right? I mean, you get your staff because you're going. Um, just like eating the meal in the way that God um, prescribed and putting blood on the doorpost the way that God prescribed shows faith. Right, because I mean, think about that. Like that's a, that, in our terms, that'd be a crazy thing to say, right? Like, hey, go home, you know, 
pick up a meal, eat it, take the blood, put it, I mean, would you do that? Probably not, right? I mean, if I were to just say, hey, by the way, I got a word from the Lord, um, which I would never do, but anyway, so that showed, in one way it showed faith, like, God, I believe this is happening. It also likely provided them a healthy level of anxiety of let's get up and, and move, right? Because you ever try to get kids out the door, you know, early on or anything like that? It's just like, well, so it's, you know, it's like, believe me, this is happening. Um, so I'd say it is an act of faith and it is um, ready for travel. But there's also something that you'll find when we get into the laws, if we get into the laws, that God is so specific, right? You know, when they, the specifications for building the ark, right? You remember some of that stuff, and we'll get to that. It's just God is incredibly specific for how he wants things, how he wants things to be done. Um, I think sometimes when God's really specific with us, it's mercy, because there's nothing like having to guess what God is thinking about you or about what you're doing, right? You know what I'm talking about. Like, that's not, it's not a good place to be. Uh, when God is specific with your life, consider that a mercy. Again, not dictatorial, but a real blessing to say, okay, God, thank you for letting me know exactly what you want. Um, right? I mean, that's, that's great. And then again, being um, Episcopalians, we are people of ritual, too. You know, we like things to be, um, you know, we're very specific. You read the rubrics in the prayer book. I mean, granted, the 79 has a lot of options, but it's still, you know, like, your limit. You know, like, yeah, you get four prayers, but, you know, you're still... You still have, you know, things that can and, and should not be done. Um, and that, again, grates with us because we're so, think of a, how culturally removed we are from this. Like 3,200 years on the other side of the world. The fact that we can even understand parts of this right now is a gift of God, right? The fact that, the fact that any of you, your hearts might resonate with one portion of this passage is unbelievable because it's so foreign, in, in many different ways, right? Would you all agree with that? I mean, this is, that's, that's crazy that we're still reading this, um, and it shows the hand of God. But, yes? Well, I'm reading about, you know, to eat it, dress, ready to roll. Mm -hmm. And then you read a little farther on, and he's telling them it's going to be this way forever, a day of remembrance. Mm -hmm. And you're going to do this on the first day, and on the seventh day, just thinking about the difference between ready to roll and then explaining to them that as the generations go on. Oh, so why is it such an anxious moment of get ready now? Oh, by the way, you're going to repeat this yeah, forever? Over again. Like what? Generations, and it's going to be seven days and 21 days. Yeah. And so, so is your question, why is God giving them all this detail now and not later? Yeah. It's a good question. I don't know. But... <laughs> Maybe it was convenient. Maybe it's like, well, as long as you're learning this, I might as well tell you the rest of it, right? I mean, that's totally possible. Um, that's a good question. That's definitely one I've never, never thought about. But uh, yeah, it, especially if you're anxious, right? Like you can like think of anxiety and trying to get out the door and it's like, well, oh, one more thing, let me tell you. And it's like, oh, okay. Um, now I don't think, I don't think with, yeah, I don't think with God you have the same reaction, but that's a good, that's, that's a good point. Oh, excuse me. Yes. Are you? We're getting there, Janie Binion. We're. The Exodus, and it is from Ramses to Sukkoth. Okay. Which is, I think, no, but I, is that not referring to Ramses the town? I don't know. It's probably, because there is a town. There is, yeah, there is a town. There's the town Ramses, um, et cetera, et cetera, which the rest of it I can't pronounce. Um, all right, so again, what's amazing about this, and I'll, I'll just, I'll, we got to move on, because we're, you know, you know how it goes with me. Um, 3,200 years, people have been celebrating the Passover. That's nuts, and they're still doing it today. It's unbelievable, because they took the command seriously. And um, well, let's look at four, verse 14, because this goes into this. This day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations, as a statute forever, you shall keep it as a feast. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall remove leaven out of your house, for if anyone eats what is leavened from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. On the first day you shall hold a holy assembly, and on the seventh day a holy assembly. No work shall be done on those days. But what everyone needs to eat, that alone may be prepared for you, or by you. And you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread, for on this very day I brought your hosts out of the land of Egypt. 
Therefore you shall observe this day throughout your generations as a statute forever. And the first month from the fourteenth day of the month at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the twenty-first day of the month at evening. For seven days no leaven is to be found in your houses. If anyone eats what is leavened, that person shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he is a sojourner or a native of the land. You shall eat nothing leavened, and all your dwelling places you shall eat unleavened bread. So, again, it's, it's specific. Um, actually, I'm just gonna, let me just continue. Verse 21, Then Moses called all the elders of the Israel and said to them, Go and select lambs for yourselves according to your clans, and kill the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and touch the lintel with two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. None of you shall go out of the door of his house until the morning. For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians, and when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. Let me read that the right way. Destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. You shall observe this right as a statute for you and for your sons forever. And when you come to the land that the Lord will give you, as he has promised, you shall keep this service. And when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? You shall say, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, for he passed over the house of the people of Israel and Egypt when he struck the Egyptians but spared our houses, and the people bowed down their heads and worshipped. And the people of Israel went and did so, as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. Does God need to see blood in order to know not to strike the house? Can we get that out of the way? No. He doesn't need to see it. It's an act of faith. Right? Like, it's not that, you know, he, he knows. Um, but, but it's still, like, this is, this is what you do. Like, this is the way that God's commanded. He's very specific. Um, and it's interesting, right? We... I'm going to get back to the specificity thing briefly and move on. We, we, can, we kind of chafe at God giving specific directions because we're just rebellious by nature anyway, right? And, you know, so if God tells us something specific, we're like, well, let me look at every possible loophole and exception, right? And then, if I, can't, and then I'll, if I can't find a legitimate one, I'll interpret the scripture sideways and upside down so I can read it the way I want to read it, right? Because, I mean, our hearts are deceitful. And I've seen, I've seen more, I call them hermeneutical gymnastics, which, by the way, don't ever write in an ordination exam because they will say that you're being um, inflammatory. But, um, you know, hermeneutical gymnastics are when you are trying to contort the Bible to say what you want it to say and you're very uncomfortable with, right? What should, what should it say instead? Anybody ever come across a passage they don't like? Yeah. Right? And, and you, have, you have a couple options with that, right? You can say, and these are... These are Legitimate options. I'm not saying that they're good. I'm just saying that they're things you can do. You can dismiss it and say, well, you can dismiss it in several ways. One, you could say, well, that's not what the text really says. Right? Like, it's not what it, re- it doesn't really mean. If you look at the, okay, well, the original word in the context of Aristotle's use, th- people do this, right? Like, Aristotle's use of this word in Phaedrus, his play, it means this. I've seen that, and it's just like, okay, you could do that. You can just dismiss it as culturally relevant only. This only applied to the culture in which it was. Now, that's possible, but that's a real slippery slope. Because where do you know how do you mark, how do you how do you demarcate that? Right? You could say uh, the Bible is written by humans, and you know God probably said something about it, but isn't very specific. You can do that. I don't, I, I don't recommend any of these things, right? Um, or you could just shut your ears to it, or you could submit to it. You know, and you could say, okay, God, I don't know why. And all of us, by the way, if we're trying to be faithful to the truth of God, we'll have that moment. God, I don't know why you're saying this, but I'm going to have to have faith in you. Um, I'm not going to start a firestorm, but there, there are some specific cultural beliefs right now that are different than what the Bible says. And when I started reading the Bible in eighth grade, I almost could not overcome them, frankly. I almost was like, God, I can't believe in you. Personally, I can't believe in you because you said this. Does that make sense? I mean, you know people like that. I was there. You've probably been there too. Um, I recommend submission to the Word of God. But anyway, that being said, um, how in the heck did I get there? I'm sorry. Um, what's, What's in the... Never mind. All right, so, um, 
Look, one more thing I want to touch on, then we're going we're gonna to run through the next part of it. Um, oh, that, oh, I got there by physical ritualistic acts of how God says things are, are done. Um, all right, one last thing is teach your children is something that the Israelites were very good at, right? This is teach your children the Passover. Teach them this. Pass this on. Teach them this. Pass this on. Deuteronomy 6, right? The Shema. Teach your children. The primary the primary spiritual teacher of your children is you, right? I, I came across this a lot when I was a youth director because I would have parents, and this is what the culture said was, you send your kids to church so they get religious instruction, you know, and it's the youth director's job to instruct them. That's not true, and it's never been true. It's the parent's job to provide religious instruction for their family, and the church supplements the religious instruction. People don't think that way, but that's, that's, that's been true for 3,200 years, just so everybody knows that. It's the parent's job to provide religious instruction. Scripturally, and you can get all gender about this if you want to, but it's the man's job to be the spiritual leader of the home. And considering the fact that almost all women I meet are more spiritual than their husbands, um, that's hard to do, right? Like, that's a real challenge, men. But that's, you know, that's, that's what it says. So... Um, that's something. You know, that's why we have the. That's why we have things like the Passover still celebrated, because they took the commands of God seriously. And you know, granted, culture is always against us when we're trying to raise our kids, and it's hard. It's just hard. But that is that's the command. And I think that many Christians got kind of lax about that in the last century, and we're just kind of like, well, you know, I'm there to love you and provide you a stable home, and then bring you to church so you can learn about God. And that's just not the way. That's not the way it is. Like, I'm, I'm, your, I'm the second line of instruction and defense and all of that. Does that make sense, everybody? Like, it's just, it's just the way it is. Um, anyway, let's move on. The tenth plague. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sat on his throne, to the firstborn of the captive, who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of the livestock. And Pharaoh rose up in the night... He and all his servants and all the Egyptians. And there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where someone was not dead. Then he summoned Moses and Aaron by night and said, Up, go out from among my people, both you and the people of Israel, and go, serve the Lord as you have said. Take your flocks and your herds as you have said, and be gone, and bless me also." That should be emotional. Um, in the Bible, it's treated, uh, you know, that, that is given short shrift. And the Bible does not, if you've noticed, the Bible does not typically go into, not typically, it does sometimes, but not typically go into long emotive descriptions so that you feel what's happening, right? Like it's not meant, it's not a dime novel, right? Like, and it's, it's, not, it's not meant to be a, um, you know, it's not meant to, I mean, there's, poet, there's poetry in it, but these historical narratives are just not written that way. But that should, that should get you a little bit. You know, I mean, you think about it, right? Um, the Egyptians, Pharaoh rose up in the night, and he and all served, and there was a great cry, for there was not a house where there was not someone that was dead. What do you make of that? Horrible, right? Yeah, what do you make of that? Any, anybody else have any thoughts about that? Had to be shocking. Yeah, abso absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. No. Five, yeah. No wonder he said get out. Yeah, because that doesn't show up, right? They had how many opportunities up until this point of having everything taken away from them? Um, which, by the way, if you know anybody with hard hearts, like it takes, it can take a tremendous amount. Um, yes, Dr. Large, what were you gonna say? At the same time. All at the same time. Yeah. And, and, right, the first thought when something tragic happens is blame. 
That's where we all go, right? When something bad happens, your first reaction is, whose fault is this? Who's, who's, who should be punished for this, right? So it's like, well, God, is it your fault? Should you be punished? We'll talk about that in a second. Um, you might be wondering, Pharaoh, like, did Pharaoh tell, people, tell the Egyptians that this was his, you know, did he just, like, kind of secretly hold on to this warning? And, you know, is it his fault, you know, that he held on to this, didn't tell the Egyptians, right? Because if you were an Egyptian, I imagine, and, you know, you learned that, you'd probably tell the Israelites to, like, get the heck out of here, right? Um, or you'd leave yourself. I mean, again, we're putting ourselves in a different context. So the question is, whose fault, whose fault is this? Who is to blame? Yes, Paul. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'd be, and. Very well be not. The percentage was substantially half of the 300. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's an enormous amount. And I would be dead, right? I mean, I, I, I would be gone by, you know, Gabriel. I'm sure you, Gabriel would be, would be gone. Um, because again, it is the fathers, the grandfather, like it's, it's generations. It's not just the kids. Yes. Do you have a. Um, I want to say something because I'm new to all this. Sure. I won't. Yeah. I was really upset. Yeah. And I'm going to say this, and please don't shoot me. That God would put an order in my face. Yeah. Was this much pain? And yeah. For the longest time, if you talk to me about the Bible, I say I don't want to hear about the Old Testament. Yeah. Because that God is mean, right? Yeah. And petty and vindictive I, and uh, terrible. Like terrible. I, I said I don't want to worship God yeah. like that, and that is really the truth of what I said. Yeah. Yeah. Emotionally, I can't put it anywhere. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm trying to remember. Somebody has a real long, scathing indictment of God, and I think it's Dawkins. Um, but, you know, it just goes on and on about how petty, cruel, malicious, intolerable God is. Um, so a couple things about that. And I'm not going to get into the whole theology of suffering right now. I am actually working on a long um, uh, explanation of theology of that that I'll hopefully have ready by next year. Um, even though people have been working on it for centuries, so... You know, I finally figured it out. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, but but it is a, there's, a, there's a long explanation for it. But a, a couple of things I want to point out. One, Old Testament God is, is and I, not that they're, they're not different people. They're just not. Um, is infinitely more gracious than he's typically represented. It's just the hard things stick with us, right? Um, those who hate me, I will punish for, what is it, like... Their children and their, you know, and their children's children. But those who love me, I'll be merciful to a thousand generations, or something. I'm, you know, paraphrasing here. So, God was incredibly merciful. But two, two, um, whenever we call God into account for what He has done, that's called no, no, it's okay. It's called theod. It's called um, it's. I think it's called theodicy. Um, I'm gonna have to look that up again. But it's basically God. Give us, because what we're saying is, God, give us an account for your being. Justify yourself to, justify your existence to us is the larger question there. Do you see, like, do you, you see what I'm saying? Now, is it natural and perfectly human for you to have those thoughts and emotions? Yeah, yes. Right? Because if you're not, you're not being honest. You know, like you can bury it and say that's wrong. But, you know, if you grew up trying to bury things that somebody told you was wrong and not wrestling through them, it damages you. So, um, so, so wrestling through that is incredibly important, but a qu- a one question that I have is, well, a couple points. One is, we think, again, in individualistic terms. This is a son. This is, a, you know, this is the firstborn. This is, a, this is a person, a baby. They thought, yeah, especially babies, right? They thought in communal terms. So it was, this was a damaging, truthfully, economic blow because that was, that was who everything was passed through. That was, that was, it was a communal term, so it was more of a hurt to the family even than the individual. Um, two, as we said, God had a right, God declares a right for every firstborn to be his. Um, they belong to God, so he's not taking them from the parents, and he's not, you know, he's not taking what is not lawfully his. Three, what happened to them you know, after death? Did God care for them? Did God love on them? Did God collect them? You know, like, like was, were their lives better being ended than they were being lived as Egyptians? Who knows? Possible. Four, um, 
when, let me think of how to put this. Um, God is, when I talk about God's justice, we always hear that as mean and cranky. But my question is, what does a perfect judge do? If you were to create, if you were to conceptualize a perfect judge, and you were, you were to explain that to a child, you know, a five-year-old, what does a perfect judge do? Like, what, what, are they, what are they supposed to do? What does a perfect judge do? Well, they're supposed to fair. Yeah, be fair. Yeah. yeah. And execute what? Justice. Justice. And mercy. And mercy. But they have to abide by the law. They have to abide by the structures. You could argue that they abide by the structures or the universal laws of nature, but we would argue as Christians, a perfect judge abides by God's own very, you know, God, God, the only law that God is subject to, I would argue, is, and it's kind of ex-lex, but it's not supposed to be, um, is his own nature. And so when God is executing judgment, realize that he's executing judgment He's not because exe- again, God thinks a lot more communally than we do. We've learned that in the New Testament and the Old Testament alike. God thinks a lot more. When we say we're in Christ, it's a communal word. Do you all understand? Like we think that we're in Christ. Like I'm in Christ. It's like no, we are in Christ. When we say you're the church, we mean y'all are. The- do you see what I'm saying? So when punishments were often inflicted, it was a communal punishment. Um, and you think about it, right? Like there are communities in which atrocities occurred. And slavery, human slavery is an atrocity. No bones about it. Especially harsh, labor-intensive, brutal, murderous, um, uh, infanticidal, because, you know, they killed the firstborn son in slavery. Like, you know, you, I would argue that if you remain silent, you are culpable in a community like that. I think you have some culpability. If your neighbor's out there beating and killing um, slaves... Uh, you know, adults and youth alike, I would say that you, you might have to answer for that someday too if you're not, if you're not doing anything about it. Does that make sense? Like, like there, was a, there's a, there is a sense, I don't want to overstate communal responsibility, um, but there is a sense in which there is a very real palpable community responsibility that's being held for the atrocities that's occurred. And let's not pretend that the Egyptians were nice people at this time. You know, like let's not, let, anyway, yes. You know, God gives us all free will. So how many times did he have to warn Pharaoh? And Pharaoh had 900 chances to get yeah. out of this. Yeah. And again, and again all, all, what we're all doing right now is we are... We're really, we're judging God. And I think that he, you know, like, because that's this whole discussion. And I, and I know, like, we want to be careful. Um, so all of this, like, let's, let's just recognize that this is all done in humility, right? Like, we're thinking out loud, and that's okay, and we're processing it, and that's okay. Ultimately, we'll subject to whatever God says, right? Like, that's the end of the road. I think we, we can have some freedom discussing it. Um, but, you know, you could argue, well, if nothing else has worked, what's better, a, um, you know, slavery of an entire population in perpetuity or the death of the firstborn of the oppressing race? It's not your call. It's not my call either, but it's something to think about. Does it make it pretty or nice? Could God have done it a different way? We tried nine other things, um, you know, so, so who knows? Do you see what I'm saying? So again, it doesn't, it shouldn't, that doesn't mean it's, you're going to walk away and be like, oh, I get it. You know, like, that felt good. You know, like, I understand. Uh, because there's things that we're just not going to. Remember the whole book of Job. Does he get a definitive answer except I'm God? No. Psalm 73, there is no, that's another one you can look up later that talks about suffering. There is no definitive answer that God comes out and says, this is why things work the way they do. But the way that I look at suffering and the hope of suffering in a nutshell, because we have seven minutes, is, um, and a lot more to cover. Um, the way I look at suffering in a nutshell is, there was a big question mark at the end of the Old Testament about how God could be both gracious and merciful at the same time. Right? Because that seems impossible. Seems impossible. And we're still asking questions about that. God answered it in large part by the death of Jesus Christ, which was both just and merciful for us, which is not something that anybody would have really put together. People didn't consider the coming Messiah to be God's son or God himself, right? Nobody thought in Trinitarian terms. So for God to die himself for us is an answer that nobody had to the problem. 
Does that make sense so far? And there's going, to be, there's going to be problems that we encounter that we do not have all the puzzle pieces for this side of heaven. We just don't. We can speculate humbly, and that's okay. But there are some things that you are not going to know. And I know that that's our Western post-enlightenment mind, hyper-rational mindset is, let, is I want to figure it all out. They didn't think that way. And remember how I said earlier, like, I would encourage you to not get so, so bound up in trying to figure out all of the answers to the universe's greatest problems that it ties you in knots and doesn't allow you to move forward. Because one, I can see that as an emotional block, stumbling block for you and God. But two, I've also seen that used as an out for people to not submit themselves to God. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, like if you, because there's things that you want to do that God doesn't want you to do. And people, that's, that is, make sure you have people who are reflecting yourself to you in your life that are in community with you so you don't lie to yourself about why you're having trouble following God. Does that make sense, everybody? That's just a general thing. Um, spouses are fantastic for that, by the way, because they show you who you are um, very clearly. Um, but good friends, do, good friends do the same. All right. Thank you, though, for bringing that up because that, that's a great question, and it should hurt. It should be hard. You know, again, I've got a two-year-old and a seven-week-old, right? Like, you think about... And, and I'm just getting to know them, right? A lot of you have kids that you are even closer to because you've known them for a long time. But you think about that, and you wouldn't call Gabriel innocent anymore because he's being obstinate. But, you know, you think about that, and, it, and it, you know, it should, you should grieve a little bit. But let's not forget who's who in the story and, and who these people are that are suffering. Um, all right, so let's finish. Oh, good night. All right, let's finish. Um, earlier, Moses said, this will be the last time that you see me to Pharaoh. The last time he was in Pharaoh's presence, he said, this will be the last time that I'm in your presence. And he walks out. This word here, when it says that uh, Pharaoh called for them and sent them out, the word in Hebrew is actually that he called, like he sent messengers to them. So don't get tripped up by that. Um, the ESV is a great translation, but there are some things that you could have a little contentious relationship with, which we're going to get to in a second. Does that make sense? So he said, here's some messengers, go out and get out of here. Um, And if I, can, if I have a second, I'm going to tie back into the death of the firstborns. So, Egyptians were urgent with the people to send them out of the land in haste, for they said, we shall all be dead. So the people took their dough before it was leavened, their kneading bowls being bound up in their cloaks and on their shoulders. The people of Israel had also done as Moses told them, for they had asked the Egyptians for silver and gold jewelry and for clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they let them have what they asked. Thus they plundered the Egyptians." And the people of Israel journeyed, uh, what does it say, about 600,000 men on foot, besides women and children. A mixed multitude also went up with them, and very much livestock, both flocks and herds. And they baked unleavened cakes of the dough that they had brought out of Egypt, for it was not leavened, because they were thrust out of Egypt and could not wait, nor had they prepared any provisions for themselves. The time that the people of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years. At the end of 430 years, on that very day, all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. It was a night of watching by the Lord to bring them out of the land of Egypt, so that this same night is a night of watching kept to the Lord by all people of Israel throughout their generations. Um, what do you all think? Yes. Why did the Egyptians give up their silver gold? That's right. Because God turned their hearts. Because God said, you know, God said that, 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 remember God said earlier said that this was going to happen. And it said the Lord turned their hearts favorably to the Israel. Now, it may have been, you know, the Israel, like, it may have been just get out, you know, like, right? Like, just like, because I doubt all of a sudden they became best friends, right? It's like, oh, we've enlaved you and, you, you know, our son's dead, but. No, but the point is, the point is. The point is that they, they did not do it, and, and it's very clear in the text that they did not do it violently, that it was not a violent thing. Like, the, the plundering is kind of, the, is kind of the, the irony of it, is really what it is, for that term to be used. It's like, God's like, I'm so powerful that you will plunder your enemies without raising a hand to them. And you'll see that, actually, later on in some of the historical narratives, that, that, that Israelites will go into battle, and God will do it all for them, and they'll receive the plunder. And then when you have to lift a hand. So it's not, it's not violence. Yes? And that's where they got all the silver and gold when they had yep. the And that's where they got all the silver and gold and how to build the tabernacle in the way that he called. They had taken it from the 
Exactly. Yeah. Yes, Dr. Lord. Yeah. The loser, you know, the, the winner gets to take whatever he wants. And that's, all right, so that's a big part of this. Um, and I've got like three more points and then we're done. So um, I've got infinite more points, but we'll just hit a couple. Um, seriously, this is, read, read your uh, study Bibles. Um, starting a little bit before this and from here on out, Israel's often defined in military terms. God, this is God's army. You know, I'm in the Lord's army, whatever. This is God's army. And they're defined in military terms or from earlier and all out. So plundered is kind of a hint that this is God's army. And this is, this is going to be God's conquering force. Um, that's already begun, that kind of language. And you'll see it's going to continue for a while on. And so again, it's plunder, plunder is a hint at God raising his army in this people. It's not they broke stuff and took people out. Two, I want to circle back real quick on the death of the firstborn and the final plague and say one more thing about this. God's, one of God's purposes, because he says it's against the gods, right? What verse is that? That he, um, we just read it. Maybe 12? What does it say? Uh, yeah, on the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. Um, there is a part of this that's actually an evangel evangelistic exercise because God is saying, none of your gods will save you. They don't save you. They can't save you. Ramses didn't save you. It became dark, right? Um, was it Hophiel? Was one of the gods of the Nile? Couldn't save you because I turned that to blood. Um, none of your gods can save you. And therefore, you know, there's a, but I can. And God will do this to you in your life, right? The things that you put as your central Things that you, res you know, we talk about this like idolatry, this whole counterfeit gods thing all the time. I'm not going to get too far into it right now, but the things that you put all your hopes and dreams in, be it being a good parent or a good uh, employee or, you know, whatever it is, um, hopefully God will challenge that in you and deprive you of it for a time so that you can, so that you realize that those things don't save you, right? Again, speaking of myself as a young parent, it's really easy for me to try to find salvation in being a good spouse you know, and having my wife approve of me or being a good father. And, you know, and maybe this will save me. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like maybe, maybe then I can be a good person. Maybe then I can have salvation. That's not true. And it should not, the things that you do that to can't bear the weight of that. Because, you know, start looking for them for unconditional affection. And that's not fair. Um, and the same way, these Egyptian gods are worthless. And what you find, and it's actually amazing. Look at verse 30. A mixed multitude also went up with them. Foreign people, not just Israelites, left with them. There was an evangelistic message here that said, these gods will not save you. Go to the God who can. And it, and it happened. It's not just punishment here. Like that, like that happened. People left. And you'll find that foreigners have, did travel with them. And actually, especially for ancient law, they treated foreigners really well. Uh, really well. They, they treated them in many instances, but not all, as their own kin. Um, does that kind of make sense? So the last thing I'll say for the sake of time, there's, there's a lot more really good stuff, uh, stuff in here. But um, the 600,000 men on foot, um, that becomes an issue with people because they calculate that to say, well, that means that there's 2 million people and 2 million people walking eight across would mean that the first people arrived in Canaan while the last people were still in Egypt. 2 million is a lot of people. Um, now, let me say a couple things about that really quickly so that your faith is not uh, rocked when you read things like, you know, that, that break this out, to, uh, that, you know, point this out to you. Um, the word there is elif, and I, I'm not pronouncing it right. I'm just telling you that. Um, it can mean thousand. It can also mean, uh, and in, in the Old Testament also does mean, depending on where you read it, thousand, cattle, clans, Divisions, families, and even oxen. It's a very broad term. Do you, do you hear what I'm saying? It's a broad term. Is it possible that it means 600,000 plus people? Yes. Is it possible that it means, um, you know, uh, 600 families or, or 600 uh, divisions or clans? Yes. 
Do you see what I'm saying? So, so again, there's some things where you're going to have to come to the text and you're going to have to say, I'm going to, you know, based on what I've read and based on the people that I listen to, I'm going to hold on to this, you know, I'm going to hold on to this, but hold it. Again, there's some things that are not, if they're not matters of salvation and not matters of the scripture pointing to itself, like there's some things like numbers where you can say, you know, there's, there's a couple translations. Be careful, right? Like that's why we have the church and each other to make sure that doesn't go too far off the rails. Like that's kind of the, one of the purposes of the institutional church. Um, but that's, that's just kind of a little tidbit for you there. So, and again, it could be divisions because we're talking in military language in a lot of this. Does that make sense? All right, do you have any questions for the last minute? Yes. Uh, did the Jewish people today celebrate uh, the Passover as our Yes. Yep. I don't know. Does anybody know? The lunar, okay, so the lunar calendar. So, okay. Yeah, sometimes it's close to Easter. Yep. Uh, I've done it. I don't know. It's a Seder meal, right? So, yeah, yeah. I've been, I've been to one. I don't know if any of you... It's really interesting. And again, if, you, if you're here, if you're a part of this church, you probably like some ritualistic things because it, it draws you in. It's really good. So, um, yeah, that's it. Um, oh, the Hebrew word for Passover is Pesach. 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 And, uh, and hey, I caught it before you did, Miss Sarah Shanklin. No, I was kidding. Um, Pesach. And it can mean limp. It can mean hover over. But it can also be like, protective like a bird. And so there's, there's a sense in which some people have interpreted to say, as God was passing over as, as a God of destruction, he was also hovering over his people in protection. Just a different way to think about it. All right, that's all I've got. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this time and for uh, your word that you have opened up to us. God, I pray that we would take these things to heart. Um, God, that in learning about you and in seeking to follow after you, we would uh, leave our, our hearts and minds uh, open and willing to be surprised by the different ways in which you reveal yourself. But help us to anchor all of our thoughts in the fact that you have revealed yourself to be loving and faithful and merciful to us. And God, help us to hold on to those truths of you. In your son's name we pray. Amen.